this is talk about um, the right to conscientious objection and this is a hot topic uh, in bioethics um, and there's basically th there's three sorts of views um, out there so uh, and the current practice in uh, English-speaking countries is that healthcare professionals are entitled to some conscientious objections so they're entitled to uh, put up their hands and say no I don't want to be involved in performing an abortion no I don't want to be involved in performing a sterilization and in some cases no I'm not in, I don't want to be involved in um, um, producing contraceptives for people but that that's it now there are some people who um, think that the right to conscientious objection should be pushed further, that it should be expanded. Okay? So some say, ah, oh, look, you know, Muslim doctors shouldn't have to uh, examine patients of the opposite gender if they don't want to. Okay? If it's against their religion, they shouldn't have to do it. Okay? They, they're currently not entitled to conscientious objection like that, but they'd like to do it. And there's some people who have the view that, look, um, healthcare professionals shouldn't be required to do anything at all that they find conflicts with their uh, moral or uh, religious uh, convictions. Okay? So anything at all. Okay? So those are sort of conscientious objection maximalists. Now there are other people like Julian Savalescu who want to go the complete opposite direction. So Julian is one of the people, I think Alberto might put his hand up uh, holding this view, a view that is known as incompatibilism. So they just say, look, um, these people signed up for a job, okay? If you didn't like the job, you shouldn't have signed up for it in the first place. Do your job. So, um, and um, the, the practice in uh, some countries follows this pattern. So in Finland and Sweden, Doctors or any other healthcare professionals have no right to uh, not participate in abortion. Um, okay, they they just expected to do their job. Okay, now, so that's the incompatibilism view. Now, what I'm going to focus on is how people have responded to the incompatibilist view. Okay, so the incompatibilist says, um, look, um, you have this prior obligation to perform the duties involved in your job. Those are your professional obligations, okay? And the appropriate remedy for you, if you uh, have some kind of moral or religious objection, is to go and find another line of work, okay? Let someone who has no qualms do the job. That's the incompatibilist position, okay? So one response is just, one response, and I think this is a very common view uh, when you talk to healthcare professionals, it's not so common in sort of philosophical bioethics, but one response is to say, well, yeah, there's two duties involved. There's a duty to do your, perform your professional obligations, and there's also a duty to your conscience, a duty to live up to your moral or religious standards. Okay? And there's a kind of a weighing going on. Okay, and people should be entitled to do this. Now, what a strength of this view is it makes sense of what's known as the conventional compromise. So the conventional compromise goes like this. If a healthcare professional doesn't want to be involved in abortion, we'll focus on a doctor, if a doctor doesn't want to perform an abortion, the doctor is expected to refer a patient to someone else who will perform that abortion. Okay? Now, some doctors are not happy with this. They'll say, they'll, say some, they'll say things like this. Look, I think abortion is murder. Okay? If you're asking me to find someone else to commit murder, you know, that makes me complicit in murder. Why would I do that? Okay? Um, you know, that, surely that is wrong from my point of view. And the conventional compromise is, well, you're just going to have to live with it because you also have this duty to your profession. And the profession has uh, a responsibility to ensure that people have all legal and safe uh, medical procedures, and that happens to include abortion. So the, the view is, in, in a sense, that 
the duty to perform abortion outweighs the um, professional obligation because it's really strong, the duty to refuse to perform abortion, if you think it's murder, it's, that's a really strong duty, but the duty to refer is not as strong, so it doesn't outweigh. So that, that, that's a sort of conventional view. Now, you might sort of question this on grounds you say, well, how do you do this weighing? This is all just intuitive. You know, these things are incommensurable. You've got these professional obligations, you've got these moral convictions, who knows how strong the moral and religious convictions are? And, you know, this, this, is just, uh, this is just not very convincing that this weighing, in fact, is going on. But the other thing you might say is, look, this is not really getting to the, the root of the problem. Uh, Julian and I think Alberto are saying, you've got this prior obligation, there's an ordering of the obligation, so it doesn't really matter how strong this religious or moral obligation is, you shouldn't have accepted uh, professional obligations if you're unable to fulfil them. One came, one came first. Okay? So, um, so, this, so they would just reject the, the whole thing about weighing. A second response um, is more like this, is to say, well, yeah, but there's something special about healthcare. Okay? Um, and um, so with healthcare, so, so here's something people say, look, you've got these important moral judgments that you've got to make, okay? So it's, it's all about life and death. You've got to make this important moral judgment, who lives, who dies. Therefore, you've got to be sort of very morally attuned, okay? Um, so therefore... Healthcare professionals should be entitled to conscientious objections. Um, now, the problem with this, I think, is it's just kind of... Um, it's picking up on this sort of strange generalisations about um, healthcare. And you might, you might find some other generalisation about healthcare to focus on. So another generalisation is, well, healthcare is about... Um, Putting the interests of your patients first, okay? It's devoting yourself to a lifetime of service to, um, you know, people who are badly off. And if you focus on that and you think, well, okay, surely uh, the duty to do that outweighs any moral or religious um, qualms you may have. So it just seems to be what aspect of healthcare you focus on um, gives you a different story about the, uh, the importance of the obligation to your conscience, as it were. Um, the other thing is, look, healthcare changes over time, it's not static. And if you look at the sort of history of how people thought about the duties of uh, healthcare professionals, say, back in the 19th century, completely different. Okay? Um, and they'll continue to change. Things change about the importance of the doctor-patient relationship, has sort of um, faded out of the picture as we've gone along. All sorts of things keep changing. So it seems odd to, um, to sort of say these definitive things about the nature of healthcare. The other thing is, suppose you, you do like the sound of this story about um, uh, healthcare professionals, the importance of moral judgment. Well, this comes up in other contexts as well. So there's an important moral judgment, say, in the military context, okay? Soldiers have to decide whether they're going to kill people or not. Now, the mil military personnel are entitled to conscientious objection, but the conscientious objection plays out in a very different way. So um, if the, a, military, a member of the military say, decides to become a conscientious objector, what they're usually asking is to be relieved of all military duties, to be allowed to leave uh, their job. The healthcare professional isn't asking for this at all. They're saying, I object to this particular activity, but I want to keep my job. Okay? So they're asking for something very different. Okay? And it's not clear why they should be allowed this. Okay? Now, 
There's another response, and this is in a paper by a guy called Michael Cholby that uh, has just come out in Politics, Philosophy and Economics, which I think is much stronger. Um, and it's also what I'm going to call top-down approach. So top-down approach is an approach that uh, focuses on a feature of the healthcare professions and then purports to tell you what doctors should do on the basis of focusing on that. And he says this, look, there's something about the healthcare professions, or most of them, um, which makes a moral difference. They're cartels. So what's going on is you have um, professional organisations uh, which have a kind of policing uh, role. So it's something like the American Medical Association you can't work as a doctor in America unless you're a you know, fully-fledged member of the AMA. Okay? Um, and typically um, other healthcare professions will be like this. There'll be one or a few societies that you have to belong to and they will impose some kind of training on you. Now, these cartels provide massive benefits for their members. So one thing they do is they restrict competition. So they artificially jack up the salary uh, healthcare professionals get from what they would otherwise get if they were, uh, if it was open slather. Um, the second thing they do is they lobby the government, usually successfully, to have subsidised training for their members. Okay? So uh, healthcare professionals in most countries have massively subsidised training. The government pays for large percentages of their training. Um, and then a third thing they will do is they will do deals to, um, to um, push for some of their, ser their services to be made compulsory. So when you have compulsory vaccination schemes, uh, that sort of thing, uh, compulsory healthcare checks, what's going on, here's a way of looking at it, is that a profession is guaranteeing itself work. Okay? Okay? So now, so society is granting these, these cartels uh, a lot of power and a lot of ways in which they can benefit their members. And in return, society expects that, uh, and is entitled to expect, that they're going to provide high quality services. Okay? Uh, society isn't doing this for no good reason. It's doing it because it thinks it'll get a better deal at the end of the day than if it was just open slather on the market. Okay? I think if you, um, if you have these, legislative, these sort of structures in place, you'll get a level of quality of service that you would not otherwise get. Okay? So arguably, they incur a duty to ensure that that happens. Now, within the context of that, Cholby argues, um, there's scope for conscientious objection. The profession has to ensure that it delivers the services it is licensed to include to provide. Now, these can include abortion and sterilization and so forth. But it can and, and this makes sense of the conventional compromise, it can allow some of its members to be conscientious objectors, provided that it ensures that someone else carries out the services. Now um, this is actually a restricted version of the conventional compromises. So um, so the conventional compromise is that you have to ref if you have a, con a conscientious objection, you have to refer, find someone else to perform the operation. Or, or you, you have to say well, this is a person who could, but you don't have to guarantee that it will be performed. So if I don't want to perform an abortion, I say, well, I'll go and talk to Alberto, um, and he can say, oh, no, go and talk to Mackenzie, and you might just never get one. Okay? And that, that's consistent with the conventional compromises that's ordinarily understood. Okay? Um, but if the service has to, has to guarantee that, if, if the profession has to guarantee that the service will be provided, then it, it has this sort of stronger duty than it's ordinarily recognised. And we do get these circumstances. So Francesca Minerva's got a, a nice paper on this in Italy with abortion, where there are so few people who uh, are willing to perform, so few doctors, heavily Catholic country, in certain regional areas, that are willing to perform abortions that patients effectively can't get them. Okay? Uh, and there's parts of America like this as well. Okay? Now, 
under Cholby's reading of what's going on, um, this should not be allowed, okay? Because the profession has a duty to ensure that all um, all the services it's uh, licensed to provide are in fact provided, okay? So it's a kind of restricted version of this conventional compromise, but it, it makes sense of it in a kind of way. Now, I think that all of these approaches uh, are kind of get the cart before the horse. So they um, purport to read off what individual obligations are by focusing on features of uh, the healthcare professions as a whole. Um, but it's not immediately obvious why an individual doctor or some other healthcare professional incurs these obligations just because their profession does. Okay? Now, um, you might have some professions where you think, yeah, that's kind of how it works. So where you div an individual devotes themselves to whatever their profession requires and is willing to do whatever it takes for their profession, if it's a sort of lifetime of devoted service type thing, um, then, uh, yes, the individual obligations can be straightforwardly read off the professional obligations. Okay? Um, but if we look at how other professions go, this is not you. This is not usually how it works. Okay, so there might be so some professions where it might work like this is arguably um, religious orders, where you simply go in there and you say, "Yes, I'm devoting myself to God, and I'll do whatever I'm told and whatever it takes." You know, if you ask me to pray for twenty four hours, and that's what I'll do. And some military forces where you go in there and you say. Yes, um, I'm willing to take unlimited risks of my life for the um, glorious cause of this military unit. Okay? But mostly it doesn't work like that. Um, so um, think about firefighters or police officers. So um, a firefighter is expected to expose him or herself to an elevated risk. Okay? So it's understood when you become a firefighter, um, you uh, you take more risks than the average person, okay? To uh, you know, put out fires, to help people escape from fires, and so on. But you don't take unlimited risks, okay? So typically, if there's some very diff very difficult situation, some very dangerous thing, you know, go into the building and uh, which is on fire right now and save the old lady. Uh, the firefighter's uh, boss will say, look, I'd like you to do this. It's, uh, they won't use this language, but it's super erogatory. Okay? It would be good if you do it. We'd love you, give you a medal, but you know, we're not going to compel you to do this. Okay? And similar with the police force, when you get situations where you get some violent riot type thing, they are not required to put their life on the line. They, are, they say, you know, who will volunteer for this difficult mission type thing? Um, uh, so um, it's understood in most of these professions that there are limits to what is expected of you um, for that profession. Okay, so it, you might ask yourself, well, <coughs> what we need to think about is how are these, ob how are these individual obligations acquired? Okay, um, now, some individual obligations you just seem to, arguably, you just seem to have. Okay? So, and um, you didn't agree to them, but you just have them. So, um, Peter Singer seems to think we have a duty of easy rescue. Okay? Uh, he's got this famous story about the, uh, the drowning. You walk past a shallow pond, there's a drowning child. You've just got a duty to help save the life of the drowning child. Okay, that's the duty of easy rescue. And it's no good saying, oh, I didn't agree to that duty. You've just got it. Okay? Similarly, you might think, look, I've just got an obligation to look after my elderly parents. Me and my siblings have to get together and ensure their welfare. Okay? Now, I never agreed to that. Um, but I've just, I've just got that obligation. So there are some obligations that seem to work that way. Mostly, however, obligations are agreed to, okay? So, um, and professional obligations are certainly agreed to, okay? Um, 
you make a choice to join a profession. Now, what exactly are the obligations that you're agreeing to when you do that? Um, well, sometimes there might be some kind of an oath or something you, you sign, um, but mostly that's not the full story. Mostly it's, uh, it's going to be implicit and it'll come through your training. Okay? As you're being trained, you learn about this profession uh, and what's expected of it, and you're implicitly consenting through the course of the training and uh, professional um, you know, acceptance into the profession to take on a bunch of obligations. Now, sometimes the scope of these is going to be, you, you have to be flexible in understanding what it is. So when I was doing my PhD in philosophy, uh, there wasn't really a, an internet. There was a kind of, there, there probably was one in CERN or something like that. Um, but, um, so I didn't have to do any online training modules. Nowadays, I seem to do endless online training modules. I have to update every couple of years in online training in uh, uh, health and safety or bullying or wh whatever it is. Um, now, I don't think it's much good for me to go back to these people who try and make me do these online training modules and say, oh, I never consented to this. Because they would be say, and rightly so, look, what you consented to is you understood that this job involved uh, working in an environment with health and safety concerns, um, and it involved working in an environment with other people where bullying um, circumstances might arise, stuff like that. You consented to get trained in whatever way we think is most efficient. So do the online training modules. Okay. So um, the scope of what you're consenting to is sort of broader than you know, you don't want to understand it too narrowly. But look, there are some things that it seems to me pretty clearly, sometimes professions will radically shift. Um, not necessarily through some kind of internal thing going on, um, but something might be imposed on them from outside. And if that happens, then it seems to me people should not be required to do um, whatever they might find objectionable as a result of that radical shift. <coughs> Now, I think um, uh, Roe versus Wade in America is an instance of such a radical shift. All of a sudden, the uh, legal system in America imposes an obligation on doctors that they just weren't expecting. Uh, you, you know, you're expected now to perform abortions. And they're quite entitled to say, well, we never consented to this. Now, we were trained in the you know, 1950s America, white picket fences, it was all very nice, and um, we just never imagined you'd ask us to do perform this uh, act which many of us um, find highly immoral and uh, not in keeping with our religion. So the strong reason why you think that that person should not be um, required to perform an abortion and why they should be entitled to um, a conscientious objection is that's not what they agreed to. Okay? Um, so, and I, I take it that's, that view is quite consistent with the incompatibility view. The incompatibility view says, look, your professional obligation comes first. And I'm saying, yeah, that's right, but focus on what that professional obligation is. It's an individual obligation that you acquired as a professional. Okay? And think about what that is. In this circumstance, it didn't involve abortions. Now, what about after 1973 in America? Well, here's something interesting that happened in 1973. So there was Roe versus Wade, incredibly controversial, and soon after that, there's a lot of lobbying going on, and the federal government endorsed something called the Church Amendment, which basically gave conscientious objectors um, a ongoing right not to perform abortions. So after 1973, if you're trained as an American doctor, um, you're trained in a system that allows you to conscientiously object to perform abortions. So you haven't consented to be required to perform abortions, okay? So there's something interesting and paradoxical about this, slightly paradoxical about this, because you've entered a system 
that allows you from the get-go to conscientiously object to this or that activity, um, you, uh, you're not required to do it, okay? Because of what you've consented to. Right, um, whereas a Swedish or Finnish doctor has no such recompense because they've consented to join a system where there is no allowance for them to uh, not perform abortions. Okay, Roe versus Wade and then the Church Amendment could have played out differently. So one thing that they might have done is they might have introduced a grandfather clause with the Church Amendment. So instead of saying, look, from now on, all healthcare professionals has the, have this right to avoid getting involved in abortions or sterilisation, they could have said, all the doctors and healthcare, other healthcare professionals who were trained before 1973 have this right, the rest of you don't. Okay, they could have done that, in which case there would have been no right for these ones trained post-73 to uh, opt out of abortion or sterilisation. <coughs> Okay, so what about um, people who become conscientious objectors later in life? What are we going to say about them? Um, now, you might think their case is a bit stronger than the, um, the early on, the conscientious objector who enters the profession knowing what it requires. Okay, I think, look, so. So, so one thing people will say to me, they'll say, oh, isn't this terrible? You're asking these people who have their hearts set on being a, a healthcare professional um, to forego that opportunity just because they don't want to perform all the duties involved in the job. Um, you know, uh, aren't you mean? And I say, well, you know, I mean, they might have fantasies about being a doctor or something, but they'll get over them pretty quickly and they can still get trained up in some other profession, have a good life, do some satisfying other good thing, and that should be fine. But someone who's devoted, say, 20 years of their life to uh, the healthcare professions and then suddenly has a religious conversion and says, no, oh, no, I can't perform abortions anymore, um, that person seems to be in a different circumstance. Okay? So you might think they have a stronger claim to conscientious objection just because it's harder for them to um, go and retrain. It's imposing more on them, as it were. And I agree that it is, but I don't think that's sufficient to make a difference morally. And the way to think about it is think about parallel cases. So lots of people um, leave professions for various reasons. Okay? Sometimes... Um, turns out they're just not very good, so they, they don't get to keep their job. Um, sometimes the, uh, the market turns, whatever the profession is, there's no longer such a demand for them. Um, and sometimes they just find it really boring. They just, after a while, you know, they've performed all these operations. I'm just bored with it. I want to go and do something else. Now, those people don't have any kind of recompense to stay in the profession and be, uh, you know, helped out. It's not like if I'm, if I'm really bored with philosophy, I can um, go and say, look, I'm really bored. Give me something more interesting to do, but I want to keep my job, okay? I'm going to find this philosophy stuff boring. Um, I'd like to be kind of, you know, do science. I want to go and muck around in the lab or something. But you have to keep paying me, okay? No one's, no one's going to accept that. So people, I think there's an implicit consent you make when you join a, a profession that you take the risks that your career might pan, not pan out the way you hoped, okay? Um, and this looks to me like just another instance of that. It might just be that, um, you know, um, uh, you know, 101 different ways in which your career didn't pan out, one of which is, oh, well, I, um, I acquired these moral objections to performing some of the activities involved in my job. Um, I think you just you bear that risk, okay? So uh, I think you implicitly consented to accept it when you entered the profession. So too bad. 
Okay. Um, right. Um, so I've kind of argued, and I've set the argument up as uh, as against the incompatibilist. The incompatibilist says, look, uh, professional obligation comes first. And uh, I've gone along with Cholby and said, yeah, that's right. But there's still scope for conscientious objection. I've done it in a slightly different way than him. So he focuses on the nature of the profession as a cartel. I think that's right. But I think you have to look at the professional obligations bottom up, as it were, as to how they're acquired. And focus on how people uh, acquire obligations in the first place. Now, the incompatibilists might respond to this and they might say, look, um, you've got, Steve, you've got slightly the wrong target here. Okay, um, you know, this is all very well and what you say all sounds kind of convincing, but what we want to know is a kind of an ideal story about how the profession should be organised. And you haven't said anything that convinces us that the Swedes and the Finns haven't got it right. Okay. Um, so um, why, you know, so, so one thought is, look, okay, I've introduced this, uh, this sort of wrinkle, as it were. I've said um, individual, ob individual obligations acquired individually, and we have to focus on how they're acquired. And um, Cholby has introduced this uh, issue about uh, professions as cartels, and he said that there's only scope for conscientious objection within that. Um, well, here's a way of responding. Get rid of all the conscientious objectors and make sure that the um, individual obligations align with the professional obligations. So only accept people into the profession who are willing to do whatever it takes. Okay? Now, you might think, look, that's just the... That's just the um, uh, most reliable way of ensuring that a profession performs its duties to society. So professions supposed to be providing high quality health care to a society. That's why we license them in the first place rather than just letting the market uh, take its course. Um, uh, and then they want to say, oh, yeah, but some of our members don't really like doing this or that and the other. But don't worry, we'll, uh, we'll organise things so that the high quality service gets performed. And then it's pointed out, yeah, but you're not always doing that, are you? Because there are these places like Italy where um, some of these services are not being performed. Um, so one response is to say, well, look, the safest way to make sure that all the services are performed is to just get rid of all these conscientious objectors. Okay? Um, solve the problem. So, and they might say, yeah, okay, we're going to you know, introduce grandfather clauses to um, you know, be nice to the current ones, but we want to end up with a Sweden or Finland situation where there's no conscientious objectors. That's the best and most reliable way for the profession to ensure high quality services to the community. Now, I think this argument is flawed. Um, and to show why, we'll go back to the risk circumstance. So you might say, so I told you about these firefighters and police officers who aren't willing to do whatever it takes. They aren't willing to um, put their lives on the line, as it were. Now, it turns out that there are, uh, there are doctors, there are surgeons who are like this as well. Okay? So there was a kind of a debate in the... Um, it was a sort of public debate, it wasn't an academic debate, in the late 1980s about whether surgeons should be required to operate on uh, patients who are HIV positive or not. And some prominent American surgeons says, no, we're not, they just refused to do it. Okay, they just said, I'm not bearing that risk. Okay, that's just too risky for me. I did, and they'd say things like, look, I just didn't sign up for these risks. I'm willing to bear an elevated risk, um, but I'm not willing to put my life on the line, okay, uh, to save these people, okay? Um, now, 
There was a complicated public debate which played out about this. And mostly these surgeons seemed to be misunderstood. They were taken to be discriminating against particular groups. So the thought is, oh, they're, they're just homophobic or, or, or whatever it is. But the actual point they were making was one about risk. Now, the debate died down because um, early on it was not really understood how HIV was transmitted. Okay? Um, and so these, doc these surgeons who were refusing to perform the HIV positive patients didn't quite understand the mechanism by which it was transmitted, so they had an elevated story about risks. Uh, so once people understood what the risks are, they were able to take appropriate measures to reduce those risks, and the debate kind of went away. But the point they'd made seems right. We don't expect uh, healthcare professionals to um, put their life on the line. We might think it's very, very nice if they do, but we don't expect that. Now, one response you might say to this is, look, what we need to do is uh, stop recruiting all these wimps and get some you know, firefighters who are willing to take the risks that we want them to take, go into those burning buildings, get, uh, you know, get surgeons who uh, are willing to put themselves out there. And you know, if we say to them, look, there's an 80% chance you're going to die if you conduct this operation on this highly toxic patient, they will take that risk um, and you know, so on and so on. Now, the problem with this line of reasoning, I think, shouldn't be too hard to spot. Um, if you do this, you're going to have real trouble uh, recruiting people. Okay? So you'll end up with lower quality services than you otherwise would. There aren't that many people out there who uh, you know, are willing to sacrifice themselves in that way. And indeed, in, many, in most military forces these days, people are not expected to put their lives on the line. It's become more like the firefighters uh, and police officers where they'll say, look, this mission is very dangerous, you don't have to do it, but um, if you put up your hand and volunteer, uh, we'll love you and give you a medal. So uh, that, that's military services these days. It's very rare to have the, um, you must do whatever it takes uh, under pain of being shot. Okay. Um, there were military forces like this. The Soviet Union was like this in the Second World War um, and uh, there were various others. But um, mostly they're not like that anymore. They've, they've gone more the direction I think they should be going. And part of the reason is they just can't recruit the right people. So the profession has this responsibility to ensure that professional standards are upheld. That's got to be their, their number one objective. And um, I think they have to compromise to do that. It would be very nice if they could find all these people out there who are willing to uh, put their lives on the line, but they're not out there. So they have to accept that there'll be uh, people who, uh, who won't. Now what about conscientious objectors? Well, it's really going to depend on the particular area you're in. If this is so in Sweden or Finland, I think they've got it right for Sweden and Finland. Okay. They don't have a particular need to compromise with conscientious objectors because these issues just aren't a, a big deal. But if you think about some other country um, where, uh, um, you know, say abortion is much more of a hot issue, it might very well be that the profession is going to, if it refuses to allow conscientious objectors to abortion, it's going to uh, lower the quality of the services provided because all these people say, well, I just can't become a doctor. I'm a Catholic, I can't become a doctor. If you're in a country which is a very high percentage of Catholics, that's going to make a difference. Okay? So it might actually be better for the profession to um, fulfil its duty to society in those countries to allow conscientious objection to abortion. Okay? Uh, so you need more information about... Um, you know, about what the society is and about how hot an issue this is before you can make that judgment. Okay? Uh, leave it there. Thank you.